Good afternoon. As Fred mentioned, I teach students English, which my wife says makes me either a fool or a masochist. And I have to tell you, like last night when I'm looking at this pile of papers that need feedback, I think she's asking a pretty good question. But English was just something that I could not resist. Teaching students to think about the human condition and to explore the essential questions of life was something that's just such a meaningful way to spend my day and to spend time. Exploring English also means that I deal a lot in narrative. It means that we explore the narrative or the plot types that you're probably used to and familiar with, the rags to riches story, the overcoming the monster, the comedy and the tragedy. And we think about how some of those might apply to our lives. When I think about my personal journey, the narrative of the rebirth, I think, applies most prominently, with school playing a central role. See, when I was in adolescence, I went through a period of time where I was very much not fully alive. In second grade, my parents got divorced, and then I started to live predominantly with my mother, who was an alcoholic. That meant that home life was chaotic. It meant that our relationship was corrosive, combative. It meant that I would lay awake at night doubting that I was destined to have a bright future, and sometimes darker thoughts than that. And it was into that doubt and darkness that came the light of hope with teachers. I met Mr. Reagan when I was a 10th grader, and, and his after-school program, The Viking Channel, was my safe haven after school. It meant that I could be with someone who valued me and believed in me, who was easy to laugh and made me feel loved. In 11th grade, I met Mr. Schertz, who saw intellectual ability and capacity in me that I would have never believed in for myself. These two men absolutely, unequivocally changed the direction of my life. And so when I went to college, I thought, what more important and useful way to spend my career than to pay that forward? To have my own classroom where I gave students the conditions to feel valued and capable, to feel that someone believed in them and held them to high expectations so that they could become their best selves. I've been fortunate to have that opportunity. I was also given the opportunity to lead students through a program that focused on helping to create a pathway from poverty to possibility. We build a site of the AVID program at my high school that has helped students from the academic middle with dreams to be the first in their family to get a college education to flourish. And in the last four graduating classes, 98% of students graduating from the program have earned a four-year college admission. <laughs> Give it up for those kids. And that has been an incredible collaborative process with our administration, with a team of dedicated teachers, with families and with community. And now my journey has taken me to a place where I try to not only apply that still in the classroom, but also scale it within a district that is focused on becoming a learning organization to meet the needs of all children. Now, I don't share my story with you because it is so special or so unique. I share with you that story precisely because it is so common. Because it is so common to have people, to any adult or a child right now, say that it was the investment of a teacher in mentoring and supporting and believing in them that changed the trajectory of their lives. It happens every single day across this country. I share it with you precisely because so many teachers get into this work because they believe that schools can be an institution that creates opportunity, because it can be a vehicle for social justice in this country, because teachers work 10-hour days, and then they do professional learning often on their own time so that they can get better for kids, because we engage in work that calls on us to be courageous and brave, to share our trials and our triumphs. Because in schools right now, today, millions of children are reading and writing and singing and dancing and coding and making and problem solving because they believe that we know how to give them the future that they deserve. And we have to rise to that occasion. And that's the narrative that doesn't get told enough 
in this country. But that's the narrative that we have to tell. Now, I'm not up here saying that it's all lollipops and rainbows in our nation's public schools. I know that if we look at the data, if you look at the data and you don't feel frustration and urgency, then I would say you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who do this work with courage and compassion and you don't feel a sense of hope, then I don't think you have a pulse. And it's on behalf of those children that we engage in this most difficult work that we call upon ourselves to share our stories, our successes and our failures with courage here so that we can engage in a new narrative, the quest. The quest that we need to collaborate and be on together so that we can have learning in this country that is so compelling that school doesn't even have to be compulsory. That school could be the best seven hours of a kid's day. That's a narrative that I want to be a part of. That's a narrative I want to join you as a part of. And let's do that together. Thank you.